Welcome to the Small Steps Big Wins Podcast. I'm dedicated to helping you take control of your life. Are you ready? Let's go do this. Ryan, I can't wait to get started. How are you today, man? I am doing great, Sue. I'm so excited to be here with you. You know, we had such a great networking call and we planned the whole podcast out and really excited to dive in you know, share with your listeners everything I do with conscious cannabis, the real history yep. behind cannabis and what this plant is truly here to do and what it can do. And then also some of the drawbacks associated with certain patterns that we come into that relationship with any type of external substance with that can lead to detriments down the line. So really excited to be here and dive in. Yeah. Oh, perfect. All right. Well, then let's get started. Why don't you just offer a little bit of background in case somebody listening doesn't know who you are? Absolutely. So, you know, one of the questions I get a lot is <clears throat> out of all the different psychedelic medicines out there, out of all the different things I work with, with holistic health and all these different things, how do they land on cannabis of all things? So the story is actually really cool. And I'm going to share some of it with you uh, today. And when I was 16, I was experiencing what I would now call generalized anxiety disorder, just general anxiety, and didn't really know what it was at that age and went to the doctor. And after a whopping five minute meeting, he told me that I had anxiety, not that I was experiencing it, but that I had it. And this is a big thing too, with what I do now in my coaching work with cannabis and beyond with identity work, right? So when you think you have something, you think it is you. So at that age, I started really figuring out or trying to figure out what is possible for me with someone who has anxiety. And that then just gave me more and more anxiety. So what ended up happening was, you know, every time I would go to see the doctor, he would recommend a different pharmaceutical. And at this point, I totally trusted the guy in the white lab coat, you know, totally didn't know any other options. So I would try to take them. And in language that I would use today, they felt me, they, they made me feel less connected to myself, more disconnected. And, you know, I was at kind of like the, the end of my rope, as they say. And I was talking to a friend of mine, and he, me he, he mentioned that he utilized cannabis for something similar. Again, when you're 16, I'm not really sure what that conversation went like, but I remember the kind of high points of it. And, and so I was like, what cannabis? Like, no, I can't be a drug user, you know, and all these things. And he was yeah. like, man, I think you're still living in a muggle world where you think that all these things are, you know, what the dare program said they were going to be right. They're going to ruin your life right, and all right. these things. And sure. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. We, yeah. We're told that in high school, like in school, right. From a yeah. young age, drugs are bad. Drugs are bad. Drugs are bad. But yet mm -hmm. you go to the doctor and all they do is prescribe drugs for you, but <laughs> that's know. okay because it came from the doctor yeah. and because the pharmaceutical company said it was okay. Yeah. It's so silly. You know, I see the, I, there's a little bit of irony there. Oh my goodness. It's so funny <laughs> thinking back to it. It's actually really comedic and so I ended okay. up trying cannabis and probably wasn't the first or second time that I tried it when I got the real hit. But the third time I tried it was when I got the result that I was looking for. I didn't know I was looking for this result, but I got it and then realized this is what I was missing. And how I would describe it into language of today is that I felt connected with myself for the first time in a long time. I felt like life made sense. And I also had an experience where I realized an experience that I was not my thoughts that I was the experiencer of my thoughts. Now, as a 16 year old, I had no idea what to do with that information. I had no context from which to compare it to. And so I then found this plant, right? I was in a state of discomfort. I didn't know why. I found this external substance that would support me and make me feel better. And so at that young age, I decided, well, if I wanna feel good all the time, I must need a lot more and more of this. And I think this is where a lot of people fall into patterns of addiction and dependency and things like that. And we're going to get into kind of like blowing the lid on what I really think that is. But basically, I ended up connecting with more and more cannabis. And I get into school for psychology. And because I was fascinated with the mind after, you know, dealing with my own for <laughs> so many years. And so <laughs> when I woke up one day when I was 18, I had my first mortality crisis. I went to the bathroom to go pee and started peeing blood. Had no idea why. Ooh. And so I told my dad, and he rushes me to the hospital. And on the way there, he asked me, son, I got to know, are you doing drugs? And I said, no, but I am connecting with a lot of cannabis. And at that point, my dad and I had never really had the conversation. I thought I was being so sly. He already knew he wasn't a cannabis consumer. But, you know, I, I saw him have this sigh of relief out of the corner of my eye when I told mm -hmm. him that I was connecting with a lot of cannabis. So I thought that was interesting because here's my dad, someone who had pretty much just been like a just say no type guy. And now I'm having I'm seeing him have a sigh of relief. So we get to the hospital. I start showing him a lot of the research I've been doing around cannabis. 
And he had no cognitive dissonance. He just decided in that moment, like, well, I guess we didn't know what we didn't know in the 80s. He looked at my mm -hmm. life. He looked at what I was doing. I was in school. I had a dream. I had a relationship. I had a job. You know, I had finished high school with honors. So he was like, you know, if this is what helps you, and he knew what I had gone through with anxiety, he was like, who am I to say that you shouldn't do it? So from that point forward, it became a connection point for my, my, my dad and I. And again, he wasn't a cannabis consumer, but he was just supportive of what supported me. And so a couple of years later, I end up still in school for psychology, realizing that my dream was kind of dying in front of me, that I didn't want to wear khakis and be in a, you know, an office building the rest of my life being a therapist. And there was way too much red tape. And so I started going through a little bit of an identity crisis, like, what am I going to do? And I went to what's called the Boston Freedom Rally one year, which is a big public display of disobedience. It was a much bigger deal before cannabis was legalized. But before it was legalized, you'd all go out into the commons and you'd all connect with cannabis, thousands of people. And they, as long as you didn't do anything that stupid, the cops wouldn't bother you. So I go there and I hear this guy yelling, who wants to make butter with me? I walk over to his little tent. And he's giving out these little pamphlets for a new school opening right near my house that specialized in cannabis and holistic studies. And I'm like, oh, my God. And this is one of the first times I felt a heck yes from my heart. And so I go home. I tell my dad, hey, can you help me with tuition? It was like 500 bucks, but I was a broke college student. So he says, I'll do one better. I'll go with you. I'm really excited to check this place out and learn more about what you find interesting about cannabis. Wow, that's so, amazing. Let yeah. me stop you right yeah, there. Yeah, Just absolutely. the fact that your dad wanted to do that. How did yeah. that make you feel at that moment where it's like your dad wants to come along for the ride and learn alongside of you? I mean, it was amazing. You know, my dad had, uh, you know, like I said, he'd always been very supportive. And, you know, my dad was someone who loved 50s and 60s music, yet he would bring me to metal shows that were like the complete polar opposite of what he liked. But he just loved seeing me and my friends have fun. And so it was another one of those feelings of like, I didn't realize at the time how lucky I was. Like, I knew it was really cool, mm -hmm. right? That my dad wanted to go. But having now worked with thousands of people with relationship challenges with their parents and whatnot, now I'm really aware of how special the connection between my, me and my father is and was and how grateful I am for his support and my mother as well. She's been a huge support system as well, just not as much with the cannabis side like my father was, but, you know, very grateful that I got to have these parents and got to have those experiences for sure. Yeah. And so your journey still continued. You went to this school and then after that, what happened? Yeah. So I ended up going to the school. I ended up taking all their classes. When I finished that, I ended up becoming an intern for them. And then I ended up working for them. And during this time of interning and working with them, one of the main things I was doing is along with them hosting classes and educational materials there and certifying people in cannabis studies, they were also supporting cancer patients and people with autoimmune disorders in remediating their cancer and autoimmune disorders with the support of cannabis. So I'm here in Boston, right? We have Dana-Farber, one of the best cancer centers in the entire country or potentially the whole world here. And at this time, this is 2011. So there wasn't a lot of these holistic options for cancer and things like that, like we have today. Yet at the same time, there is a lot of research now that speaks to this, but back then there wasn't as much that cannabis can help treat and cure cancer. THC can wow. kill cancer cells, CBD can inhibit their growth. Those are the two main cannabinoids they've done studies on. Who knows what the full spectrum of the plant will do, but basically what people were doing is they were coming to the school with these ranging different health issues. They did not want to do typical treatment. And so Mike and Melissa, the owners of the school at that time, would work with them in consulting with them how to administer RSO, which stands for Rick Simpson Oil. And this is a black, dark extract. It actually looks like pipe resin for anyone who's connected with cannabis before and knows what that looks like. But basically what it is, is it's a full spectrum extract. So the other term for it is FICO, full extract cannabis oil. But this is the stuff you can go on Phoenix Tears. That's Rick Simpson's organization. You can see hundreds and hundreds of people's results with this. You can go mm. uh, to many different places now and start noticing this. PubMed, like I said, has their studies now. So at this time, I was witnessing with my own two eyes cannabis treat and cure cancer and a myriad of other things, right? And, they, and these people would go into Dana-Farber and tell them, like, because they'd go in there to get their scans, they'd have no cancer after having stage four. And Dana-Farber would be completely puzzled They'd ask, what the hell are you doing? They'd say, I'm utilizing cannabis. And they'd say, we don't believe you because it was so far back then, right? And even now there's a lot of like people that will get very triggered when I start talking about that stuff. But I've seen it with my own two eyes time and time and time wow. again. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Let's let's take a step back a minute yeah. for 
those who are listening and maybe not be as educated in cannabis, like I heard THC and cannabinoids and a little bit of that language. Mm -hmm. Can can we talk a little bit about that first? Because I think just having that baseline would be helpful for anybody listening. Absolutely. So I'll kind of keep it as simple as possible just to give people what they need without like, you know, overdoing it because there can definitely oh, yeah, be a perfect. lot of science and things like yeah, that. Yeah, but. yeah, yeah. I mean, like we, we did that in our first call and I was like, oh my God, can we just capture yeah. <laughs> this? Because it helped me, that's for sure. So yeah, thank yeah. you. I appreciate that. Oh, absolutely. So the first thing to understand about how cannabis works in these ways and how the plant actually works with us and a big red pill for a lot of people that maybe are unaware of cannabis or maybe just haven't learned a lot about it is that the largest regulatory system in our body, the system in our body that maintains homeostasis, which is like rest, digest type feeling in our body, is called the endocannabinoid system. Now, the reason it's called the endocannabinoid system is because this system, along with having certain receptor sites, CB1 and CB2 receptor sites, creates endogenous cannabinoids, aka cannabinoids that are created endogenously within us, namely two of them, anandamide, and 2-AG. Now, anandamide, a lot of people have experienced before if they've ever had a runner's high or they've ever had a really good high from working out. That comes from anandamide. Ananda is a Sanskrit word that means bliss. And so people call it the bliss molecule. So here's the part that's really interesting is that we have been led to believe that cannabis is going to rot our brains, that reefer badness is a thing, that cannabis is the gateway drug and all these things. And at the same time, We have this endocannabinoid system that is creating endogenous cannabinoids that fit into the CB1 and CB2 receptor sites. Now, the interesting thing, Sue, is that when you look at the cannabis plant and you look at the phytocannabinoids found in the plant, aka THC, CBD, any of those cannabinoids people may have heard of before, those are called phytocannabinoids. Those cannabinoids fit directly into our CB1 and CB2 receptor sites. They are an exact match to our endogenous cannabinoids. So, okay. So, yeah. Wait a minute. So, just to paint the picture real quick, mm-hmm. it's almost like getting a box of puzzle pieces, and you've got puzzle in front of you, and that the the THC and the CBD is going to fit like a puzzle piece into the existing endocannabinoids endocannabinoid system. Yeah. yeah. In, in our, in our bodies. I think just to break it down to make it something simple, think about finding the matching puzzle piece exactly. where cannabis would be the matching puzzle piece to a part of our system that would be receptive to it. Is that a fair explanation? Yes. 100%. Perfect. And think about it this way. Once again, we've been led to believe that this plant does not have a place in our lives, but at the same time, the phytocannabinoids from this plant fit directly into our receptor sites. Like that okay, is piece. that is damning evidence that we have co-evolved with this plant, that phytocannabinoids and endocannabinoids are key to us maintaining homeostasis and health within our bodies. And so this is why I talk about this, because for a lot of us, we grew up with a lot of programming around these medicines. We grew up with a lot of programming to make it suggest that this was a new thing that no one had ever done it in the past, right? And that it was going to rot our brains. Well, one of the biggest things that I talk about with cannabis is how cannabis has been utilized in spiritual and occult practices for over 10,000 years. It's only been in the last 80 to 100 years that it's been bastardized. And the only reason it got bastardized was not for any health concerns. And anyone, please can go look this up. Like I always say, do not believe anything that comes out of my mouth. Go research it for yourself so you can see just like I did. But basically what happened was in the 1930s, a couple different people that had a lot of influence got together. One of them was Real- William Randolph Hearst. Another one was Andrew Mellon. And another one was Harry Anslinger. And Andrew Mellon controlled the biggest journalism empire of that time. So imagine today like CNN and ABC and all these kind of mainstream news organizations. But at this time, right, in the modern day, we have the internet. We can go fact check things and try to figure it out. In the 30s, the journalism empire was like the truth. So whatever they put in there, the people would believe because there was no other alternative source of info that at least could get around a lot. So basically what happened was Andrew Mellon, who owned the biggest journalism empire, and William Randolph Hearst and Harry Anslinger, they all owned vested interests also in different textile industries like cotton, like nylon, etc. And they started recognizing that hemp 
specifically hemp, was going to annihilate their industries because no more need for growing trees, no more need for that kind of paper, no more need for any of these kind of things. You can make fuel from hemp. You can make hempcrete, which is non-flammable. So you can build houses out of hempcrete that will never burn down. They actually do experiments where at like trade shows, they'll have a torch on a block of hempcrete the entire time and it never lights on fire, right? So all of these different things, they started realizing, uh uh-oh, our industries are going to get hurt from this. So they decide to invent this whole myth called reefer madness, where they invent this term called marijuana, right, which was not cannabis or hemp at that time. It's the same term, but it means the same thing, but no one knew at that point. And they go Mm -hmm. to Congress in the middle of the night and they say, hey, and this is exactly what they said. Mexican men are coming over the border to rape white women, and they're using this plant called marijuana to do it. We need to make this illegal immediately. And Congress slash politicians or officials are saying, should we have a vote on this? And they're like, did you just hear us, right? Like they're coming over and raping our women, right? And so they they create this, they, they make this plant illegal overnight. And in the morning, everyone wakes up and doctors specifically realize they banned cannabis, right? They were calling it marijuana to create this fear. And at that point, cannabis was a part of over 70% of all medicines on the market. Right. So, so this is what happened. This is what started the entire, you know, thing we think of now of your brain on drugs or any of these kind of things. Before that cannabis was an essential aspect and hemp as well to our diets, to our lives, to every aspect. And it's been that way for over 10,000 years. I mean, the original declaration of independence is written on hemp paper, you know, and, and, and hemp was so revered in the original colonies that it was actually a crime to not grow hemp in the original Virginia colony. You had to grow hemp because of how beneficial it was for the entire society as a whole, because it was so easy to use it for so many different things that it could come in handy for a lot. So it's very interesting to dive into the real history. Oh yeah. The history is fascinating there. So, so marijuana and cannabis were being used interchangeably then. Yeah, yeah. And how about today? Is that still the same today? Yeah, yeah. People still use the term marijuana. I do not because I believe it to be a racist term that was coined only to spread fear. You know, I don't get like triggered or anything when people say it, you know, of course, but I just don't choose to use it. But it is kind of used interchangeably still. And back then before that, no one knew what marijuana was, you know, like it wasn't Mm -hmm. like a term that was used. They kind of invented it there's like rumor it might have been used in certain spanish areas like before that as like a slang term but they really picked it up and made it kind of like what it was at that wow time. Yeah. i did not know that yeah. i did not know that i honestly thought they were two different things yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> hemp and cannabis are another thing like that you know they're the same plant the only distinguishing okay. factor is that hemp is cannabis that is distinguished as having 0.3 percent or less of delta 9 thc if it has more than that, now it's called cannabis. If it has less than that, it's called hemp. That's really the only difference. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So let's go into conscious use. Absolutely. How, yeah. Let's let's talk about that. I, I'm really curious now. You know, if somebody's listening and going like, okay, I'm convinced that <laughs> you know this actually does do some things that are good. What does using cannabis consciously and responsibly look like? Yeah, this is a great question, Sue. And, you know, I'll pick up my story where I left off too, because this is the perfect, you know, transition point into this. And so basically what happened was after I interned and worked for the school, you know, I was still consuming a lot of cannabis, right? Because I had mistaken cannabis as the thing that was fixing me, not that it was showing me that I could already fix myself beyond my current limitations, stories, belief systems. I didn't have context for that yet. So I'm still connecting with a lot of cannabis. And in 2014, I decided to go to my first music festival and try MDMA for the first time. And I was terrified, you know, because I still believed all the propaganda around other medicines as well. But I go out to Vegas, I connect with it with some friends, and uh, I'm in the middle of the crowd and I feel this very interesting pull towards my dad. And my dad obviously wasn't there with me at the time. I didn't know what it was. So my logical brain kicks in. I'm like, well, we're in Vegas. My dad likes gambling. Well, we're going to steakhouses. My dad and I go to steakhouses. I probably just miss my dad. Well, when I get back from that trip, I realize my dad informed me that he had just been diagnosed with terminal cancer like three days before I got back. So this is July 9th and he gets given until Halloween if he's lucky. And so he's not going to take typical treatment. And so I start talking to him and kind of convincing him to try RSO 
We had been growing at that time, starting to grow. And I was like, listen, why don't we take this harvest we're about to harvest and turn it into RSO and start administering this to you? But he was very hesitant because this is someone who's almost never connected with cannabis, maybe like once in the 80s. And now I'm trying to give him the strongest form of cannabis on planet Earth. So mm. when I discovered this whole different consciousness side to cannabis and all this mystical power that I talk about so frequently now was when I would actually administer it to him. So I thought what I was doing was sitting with him to make sure he had help if he needed to go to the bathroom or I could answer his questions. But what really happened, Sue, was I would administer this RSO to him and I would witness a totally different side of my father come out, one that was much more vulnerable, one that was much more related to what I would call the higher self, right? A more authentic and true version of what the real spirit of Harry, my father, was. And so during mm. that time, we got to take the heaviness out of conversations like death. I got to watch him have uh, closure with his grandchildren, with his other children, with my mother, with me, and most importantly, his own mortality. And it was during those experiences that I realized the connection deepening benefits that cannabis can open up. And not that we need cannabis for it, right? Because that's also what I was shown is that the plant is only showing you what's possible beyond your current limitations. Like when we're a child, we are completely open. And then we start to be programmed and patterned, right? And this isn't necessarily a bad thing. It just happens. But inadvertently through that process, our parents maybe have traumas or distortions, societal members or, you know, influencers or anything like that have certain challenges in their own upbringing, and that gets passed along to us. And so what's possible for us starts getting boxed off, right? And we start not even realizing that we're getting boxed into whatever reality we've been brought up in. When we connect with cannabis or another plant medicine, all of that goes away because we go beneath the ego and the default mode network. So all of a sudden we see kind of who we were before all that programming started. But what can happen, just like what happened to me is I mistake that as being the necessity for me to access that realm. Not that cannabis, just like a coach, was showing me a possibility that I could own in my own life. And so once my father passed, which was nine months past where the doctors had given him, you know, and I realized that I would have never gotten that time with my father if it weren't for cannabis, because as we were getting his scans back, his tumors were slowing their growth. Of course, he was still going to smoke cigarettes and do the things that I knew were giving him cancer to begin with. But at least if I could have him longer in my life, that's why I did it. Yeah. And I don't know if I would have had that time with my dad had it not been for that. I can't go back and try it a different way. But basically, after that, I ended up getting into a dispensary for five years and working there and being so passionate about really helping people with holistic health and teaching them about this side of cannabis. But what I found was that not many people were actually interested in this side of cannabis. They were just kind of come in and numb out and get fucked up and things like that. And so why do you think that was? Why do you think they weren't interested in the other side, like the the real true value of cannabis, yeah. like just looking for the high. Well, I why think, do you think that was? I think because it's simpler to just look for the high and to not really think mm -hmm. into any of this stuff, because it does take a lot of courage and strength to go into the unknown and to potentially look into the protector patterns you have in your life, your vices, things like that. Like that takes a lot of honesty. And for a lot of people, Sue, they're just not there yet. You know, I'm sure you have friends, family members, et cetera, that you know could be helped by doing this stuff and looking into their stuff mm -hmm. and working with coaches or whatever but yeah. they're just not ready yet for whatever reason. Maybe this isn't their lifetime that they are going to be ready. And that's okay too, you know? So how does somebody make the jump then if they're just coming in for the high and mm. just like, you know, I want to forget life and, and just smoke this thing to so actually going into doing the deep work? Where is the bridge there? Yeah. Well, the first thing is why, right? Like Simon Sinek start, like states, you know, start with why. And that's one of the biggest things is, you know, what is occurring in your life right now, either with cannabis or without cannabis, maybe someone's listening who's never utilized it, but this sounds interesting, or someone's listening to it is utilizing it a lot. And this sounds interesting. So regardless of what side of the camp you fall on, what is your why? What is your why for being curious about, you know, looking into either your patterns you currently have with cannabis, or looking into starting a relationship with cannabis? That's going to be the number one thing. Because if you don't know why you're going there, how do you know what to look out for? And how do you know what to co-create with the plant in terms of what to work towards? And that's one of the biggest things I teach. And we'll get into it in a second, a four-step process I have for anyone who's listening to take home and actually create practicality out of this. But basically, I think that in the beginning, the most important thing, right? Obviously, the basics uh, include if you're new to cannabis, harm reduction, low dosing. It does not take a lot to have this effect take place. I would much rather someone listen to what I'm saying 
and have five to 10 experiences where they're like, I don't know if I really felt anything versus having one where they get traumatized because they did too much. Mm. It can go on the other side too, right? You can yeah. actually overdo it to the point where it's detrimental, correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, oh, yeah, yeah. and well, it's like anything, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And fortunately with cannabis, like the, you know, the overdoing it is going to be you like potentially falling asleep potentially feeling a little bit like a green over the next day, kind of a little foggy. And that's about it. So on a one off type experience, that's not too big of a deal. If you get into a relationship with cannabis, where you're doing that all the time, and you're waking up groggy and things like that, you can definitely start to fall, fall into neurotransmitter depletion and things like that. Again, I never like to fear monger. It's not anything like MDMA where like you have to be very careful because it's in synthetic and a, a stimulant. But at the same time, right, like conscious responsible use is what I speak of, not just because I want to put rules on people, like I'm not a rules guy. It's about the fact that like, hey, if you connect with this plan in a conscious fashion, it can help your entire life become more magical. But it's also not the full scope of the equation. Because a lot of people, especially in the modern medical system, where you have an issue, you go to a doctor, you get a pill, the pill numbs out your issue, and you think the issue is fixed. What we've been trained to think is that we don't really have to do any work to fix issues in our body, our mind, our spirit. We just go get a pill, take it, and we're good to go. But with cannabis and plant medicines, we may think that the real work or the challenging part is the experience itself, the PEAK peak experience. But the real challenge, right, the real work begins when you come back from that PEAK peak experience where you felt one with the creator, you felt like you were back with deceased loved ones, or any of those types of things that can happen. The real work begins when you try to stabilize that in your life and you try to mm -hmm. start figuring out, okay, if I know that that is possible in me, because all this plant did was just allow me to release certain neurotransmitters and certain physiological processes that brought that state of consciousness on for me, right? The plant didn't do anything to me necessarily. It just showed me another side of who I am. So now when I come back, I want to figure out why can't I access that all the time? You know, why can't I connect with deceased loved ones in a sober state? Why can't I feel as though I can access joy in a, in a sober state? You know, these yeah, are the that questions. was my next question. Yeah. It's like, you know, if you're in that euphoric state or that heightened awareness state, I can imagine some people would just want, want to be like, hey, why can't I stay there all the time? So why can't we stay there all the time? And how do we deal with the fact that we can't? Yeah. Well, here's the thing. You can stay there all the time, but you can't stay there all the time with the support of the plant. And that's like really the work I do is all about like, okay, you guys love this effect you're getting from the plant, right? Yeah, we love it. Okay, cool. Let's figure out how to enhance uh, our lives with holistic health principles, spiritual practices, rituals, etc., to be able to get to that kind of awareness without anything added. Because at the end mm -hmm. of the day, it's not that cannabis is good or bad to utilize often, right? That's different for every individual right. and everyone gets to make their own subjective decision. But the thing is that if we think we need something other than just us to get any result in life, that is now disempowering us. Because at the end of the day, we want to know that we have everything inside of us. Because if we come from the source that is everything, creator, God, whatever you want to call it, then how are we not everything along with being separate from that thing, right? Like we must have mm -hmm. everything within us if we come from the source that is everything. And so what these plants and cannabis can show us are that experience of like, hey, remember that you are everything and that you are having an experience where you have this illusion of separation, but it's just an illusion. And now the training and the rewiring becomes figuring out how to get back to that childlike state. Like, I'm not a religious person, but I know a good line when I hear it. And the Bible states, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must first enter the mind of a child. If you look at a child, right, especially someone around one, two, up to six, it's like watching someone come out of a very slow DMT experience, right? Sometimes they're talking to walls. Sometimes they're just staring. Sometimes they're painting on the walls. Like, they're doing things that you know, in the psychedelic space are also common, but there are children doing it, right? So at the end of the day, you know, I look at that as like, okay, how can I get the closest to my childlike state, but still be able to have my adult faculties online? 
And so mm. doing things like meditation, breath work, spiritual practice, journaling, working with coaches, holistic health principles, all of these different types of things, biohacking, all these different types of realms are what we focus on when we teach alongside all the cannabis education to allow people to not just become more conscious with cannabis, because that in and of itself, who knows how important that is? It's different for every person. But what's really important is that how we do anything is how we do everything. So if we start looking at someone's life and their relationship with cannabis, and we start bringing more conscious awareness to that one little microcosm, well, that's naturally going to be able to ripple effect or have an opportunity to ripple into every aspect of their life. So it's very common for us in our work to be working with someone on their relationship with cannabis and have them start looking into their romantic relationship, their relationship with themselves, their relationship to money their relationship to their business or their line of work, their relationship to the creator. And so all of a sudden they join for working on the relationship with cannabis. And now because they're essentially working with a pocket coach that they can connect with intentionally, get a crazy mm -hmm. amount of awareness and ideas, then have the system to come back and implement that alongside the community that allows them to re remember that they're not alone. They're not crazy, right? This has been done for over 10,000 yeah. years. That's yeah, right. really how we take we take someone from being unconscious, not only with the relationship with cannabis, because how we do anything is how we do everything, but being unconscious in their life to a more conscious expression of being alive as a human being. It's really cool. Yeah, that is. That is. And I hear the common thread in all this is education. Yes. Education, education, education. And you mentioned before that there was a four step process. Are you ready to jump into that now? Oh, share, yeah. share that. I am. Okay, down. let's go. Let's go. So the four step process we call the highly optimized way. Now, the reason we call it that my business is called highly optimized. It's all about just like it states being a highly optimized individual, physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually, you know, as I like to say, being un -F withable, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to swear, but you know, you get the idea. Yeah, right? sorry, yeah. It's all good. <laughs> so this idea you can of, drop it every yeah. once in a while. I'm on the cool. E rating. It's all good. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, this idea of being the best version of ourselves, right? That's really what our entire business is shaped around. And one of the ways I've found to get there that's very practical is by utilizing cannabis consciously to gain the awareness and essentially do a year and years and years of therapy in a series of months, right? Now, again, this doesn't mean that you just go get high and everything fixes itself in your life, right? And this is what this process is all about. <clears throat> so the first step is before you connect with the plant, right? Let's say someone's listening and they're like, this sounds cool. I'm going to, I'm going to do a ceremony, right? Okay, cool. Before mm -hmm. you do your next ceremony, take a three day break minimum before you do that ceremony. Now, for many people, cannabis is pretty normalized in, in, in being in people's lives every day, right? Many people that reach out to me are everyday consumers. I connect every day from time to time. I take months off at a time. I take weekdays off. It's always different, but it's a plant that can be utilized every day. People can normalize it. And there are people mm. that really do benefit from daily use, right? Especially people with uh, clinical endocannabinoid dysfunction or deficiency syndrome, people like that. <clears throat> but the thing is, if you want to experience the psychedelic powers of cannabis, it really helps to not have an endocannabinoid system that is saturated with phytocannabinoids from day to day use. And okay. so, so that so I, I would pick that to mean occasional use then if you yeah. really want the heightened effects rather than doing it every day. Exactly. Okay, I just want to make sure I, I'm tracking and I, I'm listening. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and so think about this, right? Maybe someone's listening who's like, well, I have an autoimmune disorder, like I really need cannabis every day to stay off pharmaceuticals. That's totally oh, fine, gosh. right? Like, yeah. you can do that. It's individual. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you can do that. And let's say if you really want a ceremony, try taking one day off, try taking two, right? But the idea is three, <laughs> like 72 hours will give you a lot of flushing of your ECS system. And so from that point, now you're going to be primed and ready. And here's one of the things that I talk about all the time, too. If you're connecting with anything every day, right, if you're having cacao every day, right, it gets normalized in your experience, you forget mm -hmm. a lot of the subtleties of what it does. And so taking that three day break is also very similar to if you're in a romantic relationship, taking a three day break from your partner, right, like going on a girl's trip or a boy's trip, right. And on mm -hmm. let's say you leave on a Friday, you're like, Oh, I'm excited to leave. This is awesome. And then you leave. By the second or third day, you're like, wow, I really missed that good morning kiss. Wow, I never realized how much I loved the way my partner cooked my eggs. All these subtleties start coming out, right? And so when you take a break from cannabis, just like anything else, the heart can grow fonder for it. And you start being mm -hmm. able to distinguish more and more of these subtleties because you have a control to compare it to. Everything in life works on polarity. So if you're always on one polarity, right? 
you don't really understand mm -hmm. the other polarity. So to understand an altered state, you need to understand sobriety, you know? And so that's a big portion of this too. But before you decide to connect in ceremony, take that, take a break period, but you know, gold standard is three days. Now okay. let's say day of the ceremony, right? You're getting ready. You're getting prepped. You're like, I've done my three day break, or I've taken my small break. I'm ready to the rock. The next step, step number two is to set an intention, right? So this could be as simple as I'm looking to experience joy. It could be as complex as I just experienced a trigger with my romantic partner and I am looking to see why that triggered me so much. It could also be I'm looking to connect with a deceased loved one. It could be I'm just looking to experience something new, right? Now, again, like there's there's a whole range of what is accurate when it comes to intention. And what I'll tell people is there is no right or wrong, right? Like I think a lot of people, when they hear the term intention and they think about ceremony and things like that, they think there's like this very, you know, uh, specific way you have to do it. But in reality, it could be as simple or as complex as you want it to be. Oh, well, that's good to know for yeah. those of us out there who want to micromanage it and go, oh, what if I pick the wrong intention? Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> your answer is you, you can't pick the wrong intention. It's kind of like what you're feeling on the inside. And as an aside, would you agree that it's really important to try and connect with your inner self as best you can oh my God. before you set that intention Definitely. and just let that intention like be natural, like flow in there, but just you know, get in touch with yourself. And I, I would imagine if you're taking that three day break uh, in step one, mm -hmm. that that would also help with that as well. And I'm assuming if nobody has used cannabis before, then step one is not for them exactly. or not necessary. I mean, exactly. Okay. Yeah. This is more for people that are connecting with cannabis on a, you know, uh, daily or by, you know, by daily type of frequency. And mm -hmm. I'm glad you mentioned that because this whole idea, right? Like, you know, getting in touch with the higher self can be tricky because we have all these programs and patterns within us, right? We're not really sure a lot of us like when if I say, Sue, connect with your higher self, you're like, is there an objective higher self? Like, is there, how do I know? <laughs> I'd, I'd say, what the hell is that? Yeah, mean? exactly. Like, how do we know? Like a lot of these. Like, how do terms, I know it's my higher self, right? Yeah, you exactly. Know, like, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then like, how do we know the higher self from intuition, from like the voice of the soul, right? Like these are very qualitative right. things that are very hard to put like a exact definition on. So what I usually tell people is, you know, whatever's top of mind or heart, that's where to start. And when you go into like subconscious reprogramming work and you're working with kinesiology and things like that, they talk about the same thing. Like I may go into a brain integration appointment, which is a certain therapy I do. I may go into a brain integration appointment and say, yeah, you know, I've been kind of fuzzy recently. I really want to work on that. And my practitioner may test my muscles and say, well, uh, your muscles actually want you to look at your liver first. And so like, there's this idea here, right? Of the same kind of thing. Like we may have a preconceived notion, but the most important thing as I found in doing this so many times myself and helping other people is whatever comes up, usually it's something that might trigger you or might not be the most exciting thing. Some days you'll be in a really high vibe and you'll be able to connect to something very high like that. But whatever is kind of the, the front facing domino, work on that, right? Especially like, for instance, if you want to experience more joy, right? But you're feeling anxiety right now, the best way out is through. So I would tune directly into that anxiety, knowing full well that once that emotion is felt fully, you will return back to your natural state of being, which is joy. Because if you look at a kid, they're in a state of joy until they have an emotion arise. They haven't learned programming yet that tells them the emotions are bad. So they just let them out. Yeah. Adults are like, not here, shh, quiet, right? Because they have the programming that these emotions yeah. are bad. And then the kid gets it over and just is back to joy, right? So you know, once you've set your intention, I like to actually speak it into the medicine, right? So you can hold your flower or your edible or whatever, and we can get into the differences with those two things in a little bit. But mm -hmm. you can hold your medicine, speak your intention into it. And your next step for step number three will be to create a ceremonial container. Now, this is another term that gets a little people puckered a little bit, right? When they hear the term ceremony, they think they have to wear white robes and, you know, be very reverent. And yeah, there's a certain amount of respect and reverence that you want to bring to a ceremony. But I want people to drop the idea that you have to be in these white clothes or any of the kind of things they have as preconceived notions. To me, a ceremony is a certain set and setting that you have created intentionally for your intention to play out within. And so, for instance, let me give you an example to kind of bring this home. Yeah, so please. let's say that you have a intention to explore a block you've had with your romantic partner right? Maybe you're in an argument, maybe you got triggered, maybe you're just feeling frustrated, whatever. 
a correct ceremonial setting or a proper ceremonial setting for that would be a place that you feel is very quiet, a place that you feel is very safe, a place that you really have the ability to not be distracted with external you know, stimuli and really to go deep. And so you may do things such as burn sage beforehand to cleanse the energy of the space, right? You may do Palo Santo, burn Palo Santo to reinvigorate that space with positive energy after you've cleansed it with the sage. You may do a seven directional prayer saying thanks to all the seven directions, north, east, south, west, to the sky, to the earth, and to your center, your heart. You may decide to lay a yoga mat out. You may decide to have light music on, right? Any of these things, because what am I talking about here? I'm talking about being intentional about what intention do I have? What set and setting, what mindset and what setting will allow that intention to play out? And how can I create the best setting for that intention? That is my definition of creating a ceremony, right? So on the other hand, maybe you are connecting with cannabis with a friend you haven't seen in a long time. And your intention is to have a lot of fun with this friend. Maybe they came in from Colorado and you live in Boston and you don't get to see them that often. And so your intention is to have fun with them. Well, in that kind of scenario, maybe a proper ceremonial setting could be a dance floor. It could be going to the beach, right? It could be any of these aspects where you're saying, you know oh, what, wow. that could be a really cool place for us to go have a conversation, connect again, et cetera. So that's where I differ. I do not think a ceremony has to be in a church. I don't think it has to be in white robes. It doesn't have to be those things. Those are human things, human rules that we put on us. That doesn't actually exist, right? I've never once talked to any high dimensional being and them say, well, we would have helped you, but I don't see you in your white robe. You know, like that's all trivial human <laughs> stuff. They are so yeah. far above that they could care less, right? So yeah, it's so, amazing how many limitations we put on ourselves that yeah. we really don't need to put on ourselves that are just completely unnecessary. Exactly. And it's somebody else's belief. It's not your belief. So I'm so glad you brought that up because yeah. I heard you say the word ceremony a couple of times and that word could evoke in us formality and it has to be done a particular way and there has to be certain things present in order to make that a ceremony and in a way it does. But the difference is that it's totally up to you what your ceremony looks like versus somebody else's. So I, I appreciate the differentiation there. So for number one is wait 72 hours. Number two is set the intention. Number three is create a ceremonial container, mm -hmm. which I love that ceremonial container. Yeah. <laughs> it's just the picture. I don't know what it is <laughs> about that, but I love that. <laughs> yeah, 100%. And you know, you hit a dead on Sue, right? Like the idea is we want to be conscious. We want to have respect mm -hmm. for the medicine, but we don't need to worship the medicine. The medicine doesn't want that. The same way that your coach, right. Austin, right? Or my coach, Ani, like they would never want us to show up and start bowing to them. They'd be like, hey, stop. I don't know what you're doing. This is weird, right? <laughs> they want us to respect their, their time, show up on time, do the things that we talk about together, but they don't want us to worship them. You know, like that's where right. a lot of people get confused in the medicine space is like cannabis does not want people to worship it. It wants people to respect it. There's a big difference there. And so like the idea here is for me, you know, when it talks, when I talk about ceremony, you know, a lot of people are like, well, where's your white robes and these kind of things. It's like, listen, all that you're doing is making sure that you're conscious and aware of what you're doing and why you're doing it. It's really for you. The medicine is not, does not care at all, right? Because right. Medicine is like, well, I'm only going to work to the degree that you've been consciously aware of what you're looking for. So I like the medicine isn't not benefiting at all, right? Like it's us that get the main benefit from taking the time to really be conscious with it. So we've covered the three steps. The fourth one is the most important one, in my opinion. Now, the fourth one, we talked about this before, right? A lot of people assume that if they just do a bunch of ceremonies, they'll heal their trauma and these kind of things. And yes, there can be spontaneous healings that can definitely happen. But what I will say is 90% of the time, at least 90%, you're going to have to do some work on the other side to balance out that equation. The same way that when you work with Austin or I work with Ani or anyone here has worked with a mentor, you don't just show up and go, hey, why did my business not work? And they go, poof, now you have a perfectly paid ad structure and poof, you have 100 leads, right? <laughs> They're going to share yeah. with you, hey, you got to get this pipeline set up. Hey, go on this podcast. And then you have to go after that appointment and go do that stuff, right? And if you do, you will start to see benefit in your life. So step number four is integration, right? Now, what I always say is that integration, like I previously mentioned, is where the real work begins. Because when you experience an altered state, 
you start to realize there's more possibility, more curiosity, and more things for you to tune into than you previously experienced. But it's almost like this. This is a great analogy. It's like you have basic cable at your house and you go to your friend's house and he has pay-per-view. And you're like, this is awesome. Well, you can't just go back to your house now and have pay-per-view. You're going to have to either find out how to get pay-per-view or pay for it or figure out someone to install it. And then you can have pay-per-view at your own house. So that's kind of how these medicines work. Now, maybe they do a free trial, right? One day where all of a sudden you turn your TV on and you have pay-per-view for a day, right? That's like the spontaneous healing type stuff that can happen. But not often does that happen, right? Like more often is it the first way I stated, you know? And so what integration will look like, I'm, I'll make a very practical example. And this is one of the reasons I love cannabis and think cannabis is the most practical plant medicine in existence. So if you take five grams of mushrooms or you drink ayahuasca or you do 5-MeO-DMT and you get what I call a high idea, right? An idea that came from a higher place. It can be very challenging to remember that idea, write it down and or take action on it in the moment. So what will often happen is you'll be in an experience you'll get this idea and it will kind of just float away after, right? Because you just, you literally can't actually function to write something down, right? So mm -hmm. imagine an intention where an individual decides to set an intention to explore a creative block that they've been experiencing. They don't know why, but they just feel stuck creatively. And so they decide to go into a ceremony with the support of cannabis, ask cannabis that question and dive into the ceremony. And now they're in the ceremony, maybe they're meditating, maybe they've decided to do breath work, maybe they're taking a walk, whatever it is. And all of a sudden they get the idea. They're like, oh my God, I used to love painting as a kid. I haven't had the time to paint, right? That story. I haven't had the time mm -hmm. to do that in years, but now I'm realizing that's completely false. I have the time, right? So in an ayahuasca or psilocybin ceremony, you might get that download and be like, I hope I remember this. With cannabis, mm -hmm. what you can do to integrate right on the go is you can sit up from that meditation, you can go on Amazon and you can buy a paint kit, or you can Google paint classes near me, look one up, book a, book a spot there and dive right back into your ceremony. Like nothing happened. Oh, wow. Right? I'm glad you shared that because sometimes like I think of ceremonies and, and you know, whether it's a psilocybin ceremony or whether cannabis mm. that you don't have that functionality. Like you don't, you know, like what level is it at that you can function yeah. versus not? Uh, so yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's like, I, I'm not sure. Cause I, I have friends that have gone on psilocybin, mm. sacred journeys, spiritual journeys mm. that they were called. And, you know, they were out for like six hours. And that was actually another question is how long does a ceremony usually last mm. for cannabis? Yeah, that's a great question. So through an inhalation method, and I'll talk about why these are different in a second too, just to give some context, but through an inhalation method, like vaporizing or smoking, roughly around two hours from start to finish, maybe a mm. little bit more, like you'll feel a little bit of like, you know, after effects, but like the main thing is about two hours. And even within that, like for someone like me who's seasoned with cannabis, maybe about an hour, you know, and unless mm. I like really like, try to smoke a lot. Typically for me, I'm, I'm taking a couple of hits, getting to that certain level of alpha, alpha brain waves that I want to reprogram my subconscious mind, diving in, repeating same affirmations, doing a little work, coming right out of it and going on my day, you know, because mm -hmm. when you're in an alpha and theta brainwave state, you have the doorway to the subconscious open. So that's why for me, you know, there's a lot of people that are like, no, you should only have to do things sober. And I'm like, listen, for me, it's all about efficiency. If I can open my subconscious and get things in there way quicker, why would I not do that? It doesn't make any sense mm -hmm. to me. You know, sure. this is how, yeah. like, Sue, this is exactly how I took myself from working at a dispensary that I didn't like anymore, going home and watching Aubrey Marcus from my bedroom and hoping one day I got to meet him to now being personal friends with him and going on his podcast a couple of years ago wow. and going back on this summer. Like, this is exactly how I did it. I looked into my subconscious with cannabis, reprogrammed all these limiting beliefs and stories. And that's how I've gotten here today, along with, of course, like other things along with that, but that has been pivotal, you know? And that's like, what I tell everyone is, I wouldn't be standing here if it weren't for me doing these practices very often and having them work really well in my experience. But what I would say is through an edible method, it can be anywhere from four to really eight hours, depending on your metabolization oh, wow. rate of Delta 9 THC. 
And the reason why there's a stark difference there between inhalation methods and edible methods, and this is something really important because someone may listen to this episode and be like, I, I believe, Ryan, I want to go try cannabis. This is something you want to be very aware of first. First of all, discernment is key. Cannabis is not for everyone. It's not everyone's plan. The same way that I may love dark chocolate, but it's just not everyone's cup of tea. It doesn't mean dark chocolate's good or bad. It's just not for everyone. Cannabis right. is very similar. Don't allow yourself to get FOMO and hearing what I'm talking about and be like, oh, I think I need it, right? Like, you know, tune in. You may require it, right? It may really support you, but it also may not be your medicine. And so I always want to say that. But the reason it differs is because when you're ingesting cannabis versus inhaling it, Delta 9 THC, which most of us know to be the intoxicating component of cannabis, one of them anyway, that, mm -hmm. get, that gets converted by our liver into a totally different cannabinoid called 11-hydroxy-THC. Now, it's not important anyone remembers that name, right? What's important mm -hmm. to remember is that that cannabinoid is between one to seven times more intoxicating to the CB1 receptors, right, where Delta-9 THC and the intoxicating components of cannabis attach to than simply Delta-9 THC. Then you also have the metabolization rate too. So Sue, you having never used cannabis or maybe never used cannabis, you could potentially go to a dispensary, get a 10 milligram edible, which is a pretty low dose. Five would be like the lowest I would recommend going, but you mm -hmm. could get a 10 milligram edible. You could take it expecting like, okay, I'm going to feel something and not feel anything. Right. Or you could go take that 10 milligram edible and be like, oh my God, that was a lot. Now, why? Yeah. Why is that? Right. It's all to do with how we metabolize Delta 9 THC. Now I'm 6'5", mm. I'm 190, I have a very fast metabolism. I'm a slow metabolizer of Delta 9 THC. My girlfriend, on the other hand, she's 5'3 and a half, 100 pounds soaking wet, and she's an extremely fast metabolizer of THC. So what this will look like is if I take a 10 milligram edible, I'm like, I am perfect, right? I'm deep into meditation, mm -hmm. I'm awesome. If she takes 50 milligrams, she's like, I'm bored. I'm not feeling anything, right? <laughs> so that's why I tell everyone, you know, there's two ways to do this. Number one is trial and error. Start very low and slow and slowly build your way up and just see what titration point works best for you. The old, you know, trial and error method. The other way, especially for someone like you, Sue, or someone listening who is maybe like, they're very highly optimized in their life. And if they're going to entertain this, they're going to really do all the research would be to, walk, to to look up my buddy Len May and his company Endo Health and go spend $200 on a DNA test where he will send back to you exactly what ratios, what cannabinoids, what terpenes and everything oh, wow. about cannabis that works best for you. He'll also be able to tell you if you have a predisposition to schizophrenia through your AKT1 gene. He'll be able to tell you so many different things. So that's what I tell everyone. If you're if you're curious but you're hesitant, get that. And if also if you're curious but hesitant, don't start with cannabis, start with hemp. Because remember from the beginning, hemp doesn't have THC. So it will be psychoactive. You might feel the ground on your feet a little bit better. You may feel like you can breathe a little deeper, right? You may feel, may feel more calm, kind of rested like you do in the morning or at night, but you're not gonna be intoxicated. And you can get hemp edibles, you can get hemp flour and smoke it if you're a smoker, you can vaporize it, et cetera. There's a great company I like called Simply Soul Farms and Soul is S-O-L. Mm -hmm. They make great products. I have their hemp rub right here. So even if you don't want to smoke or feel anything, you know, you can use these rubs, right? These CBD and CBG rubs instead mm -hmm. of, you know, NSAIDs and, you know, inflammatory, anti-inflammatories and things like that works fantastic. Wow. Just Arnica, hemp wow. cream, things like that. Yeah, so yeah. There's a lot, you know, you can do with cannabis, not to mention it. Hemp is a complete protein too. You know, so for people who are looking, yeah, for so you protein, could eat it, yeah, yeah. Well, I actually have hemp seeds in my refrigerator downstairs. <laughs> I never even thought about it. I'm like, oh, yeah. you know, I just I throw them on salads and stuff. I got to get back into those. I think, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's. I should explore that some more. You know, I want to pause for a moment here. You were talking about yourself and your girlfriend mm. on dosage, and I want to make sure I heard you correctly. You said you could take a 10 milligram dose and you're pretty good and your girlfriend who is like five three and a hundred pounds soaking wet did i hear you correctly and said she needs to take like 50 milligrams oh which is a lot more than yeah. what you would take to me that seems counterintuitive is there a reasoning behind that yeah so or is that just because of who she is yeah like her the yeah, her liver metabolizes THC quicker. So in order for her to feel oh, any okay. effect, her dose has to be bigger. So we'd have that happen all the time when I worked at the dispensary. 
is like these elderly women would come in their 70s, 80s. And we'd, of course, be like, start with two and a half milligrams, super light. And they'd call us and be like, I'm not feeling shit, you know, and, and they'd be <laughs> upset. Right. And so they would end up coming in a couple of weeks later after they figured it out. And they're like, yeah, I'm at 30, 40 milligrams. And, yeah. and I'm like, that would I probably have, be my case. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and I find that with 50, yeah. <laughs> let's get this 10 shit. Well, you know, it's, let's get for the goal. Let's go. <laughs> it, it's funny too, that I find on average. And again, I don't have like a scientific study to back this up, but through my yeah, experience yeah, right. working with thousands of people at dispensary, women naturally can handle a lot more cannabis than men. I don't know why it's not any like award necessarily, but it's just a thing. I don't know why, probably because you guys can just, I mean, it could be physiological makeup. It could be like a yeah, current yeah. trend or like, you know, similarity in your endocannabinoid system from female to male, something like that. I'm not really sure, right. but it is super yeah. interesting though. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Ryan, I want to be mindful of your time. I know we're coming to the top of the hour here and I'm looking at the clock going, oh my gosh, I know you have to be somewhere soon. And I want to be, I want to wrap this up, but yet this conversation is so good. And I feel like there is so much more for us to hit. So yeah. it's just another reason to come back on the podcast Definitely. and we'll just follow up with a, another episode of which I would be excited about. So so just real quick, starting points for people would be to reach out to you to get educated and to just learn first. Definitely. If they're curious, is there, did I miss anything else in there? Yeah. So if someone is curious, if someone is right now feeling as though they're suffering from patterns of dysfunction or dependency on their relationship with cannabis, maybe they feel like they can't put the plant down. Maybe they feel like the plant's doing this to them. The mm -hmm. plant makes them anxious. The plant makes them paranoid. Or on the other side... Maybe they're struggling with a lot of that stuff and they're thinking that cannabis may support them. The main thing that we do is we host a, a community called the Conscious Cannabis Collective, which has all of our courses in there. It has everything so that you can become a master of working with this plant and a master of working with yourself. We teach all holistic health principles in there too, spirituality, everything in there, awesome. along with having support calls. That would be the easiest way to reach out. We also have our monthly webinars. So if you want to come experience psychedelic cannabis, maybe you're someone who's listening going, I don't believe cannabis is a psychedelic. I've never experienced a psychedelic side of this plant. Prove us wrong. Come out to that event, right? Breathe with cannabis. We do it once a month online. You can do it from the comfort of your own living room. We have one next Thursday, depending on when this gets released. On the 16th, we have one. We have one every month. So just look on my Instagram if you want to find the next one coming mm -hmm. up. And you can come out to that and experience it for yourself. We take you on a two and a half hour cannabis and breathwork experience that will change your life, guaranteed. So depending on when this is released, we'll be coming out with two new courses. Clarity with Cannabis is a great place for people to start. It's extremely inexpensive. We put it out there so that people can really break this idea that they're addicted to cannabis because they're not addicted to cannabis. They're addicted to escaping the feelings of discomfort stemming from traumas within them, and they found cannabis to be the external tool that helps in that situation. So to the degree they don't know how to get through those things on their own, is a degree to which they'll need more and more support from external sources. And so that's what we're really teaching people in Clarity with Cannabis is how to actually go in and evaluate what are the triggers that are leading to unconscious patterns of the plant? How can we then become conscious around those things? And how can we get into a little bit of parts work to really start to figure out what is that part of me that wants to be dependent all the time and use utilizing cannabis all the time? Why does it want that? Let me allow it to have a voice. And then what's this other part now that's very aware of wanting a healthier relationship with cannabis? What does it feel will happen when things change? Let's get clear on that and mediate between these voices so we can actually come to true freedom. Because to me, freedom is not abstinence or addiction. It's in the middle. And that's why I'm personally not a fan of AA and other things like that, that believe that the only answer is complete abstinence and don't go to any bars or anything and don't be around it. Because to me, that's just not freedom. You know, freedom comes from being in the moment and saying, Hey, you know what? Yes or no, you know, and not being attached to escaping through a trauma or something of that nature. So I would say reach out about Clarity with Cannabis, reach out about the CCC. If you're already an experienced user, come out to Breathe with Cannabis. You know, we have lots of ways you can plug in and experience this for yourself because I never want to be a talking head. You know, these are all great things in theory. They sound awesome. But if people just hear me and they get excited and then they just forget about it, nothing's going to happen, you know? And so I really right, want people to right. do their own research, you know, come to one of the things we do and experience it for yourself, you know, because that's the biggest thing. Life is not an observation sport. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Do you have one minute? Because I always ask all my guests no. the same question. You ready? Yeah. Okay. All right. So what is one small step someone can do today that's going to help them change their tomorrow? Mm, awareness check-ins. 
This is a new thing I've been doing. So a lot of people may be adverse to meditation. They may feel like they don't have the time for it. So here's what to do, right? Once an hour, every hour that you are awake, you can close your eyes and you can picture yourself from a third person point of view, right? So I'm picturing myself either above me or out there or behind me, wherever you want. And you repeat this to yourself. You say, and obviously you put your own name in there, but Ryan is not his body. Ryan is not his emotions. Ryan is not his thoughts. And Ryan is not his experience. Ryan is a fractal of the infinite awareness stemming from the creator. And you just check in and you do that once an hour, every hour. And what that starts doing is it starts separating all of those things from who you think you are. You experience your emotions. You experience your thoughts. You experience the experience you're having. But you are not the thoughts, you're not the emotions, and you're not the experience. You know, you're not the human. You are operating within the human, right? The human is a vehicle that you're living through, but you are not the human. And so I found that to be extremely beneficial and really easy for people to start. You can do it in 30 seconds. Oh, wow. I'm excited. Wow. I think I'm going to do that myself. Heck yeah. Well, Ryan, thank you so much for the gift of your time. This has been amazing. I can't wait to have you back on the podcast. Absolutely. Sue, you are the best. Thank you so much for being a great host. Thank you to everyone who tuned in and so excited to come back yeah. on and dive in again. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Small Steps Big Wins podcast. I value your time with me and I seek to make every moment count. In order to make lasting change in your life, listening is usually not enough. So I want to ask you, what practical steps are you going to put into action today as a result of listening to this podcast? Remember, any step, any action, no matter how small, starts your journey to a big win. And if you're not sure where to get started, check out my website, personalcoachfinder.com and find someone who can help. Remember, life doesn't get better by chance. It gets better by choice. Take small steps today and make your life awesome, friends.